Hello guys, welcome back to the channel. And today we're going to be looking at an article that was published in the Journal of International Society of Christian Apologetics. This is the volume 10 and it was published in March 2017. So it's a bit dated, like five years now, but there's a particular article in it that I think is worth interacting with and responding to because I think it will be a kind of a good learning experience and it's a scholarly level article so it will give us a good feel of the kind of objections and talking points that are raised in response to things like Van Tilian apologetics. So the article we're going to be addressing today is this article by David Haynes, The Potential Problem with Presuppositional Apologetics. So at the time, David Haynes had an MA from the Southern Evangelical Seminary and he was also a PhD candidate from the from this university over here. I cannot pronounce that. So he's a fairly credentialed individual. Obviously, uh, has more credential than me. So I think it it's a good article to serve as a kind of overview of the kind of thing that people say about presuppositional apologetics or Van Tieren apologetics. So let's just jump straight into it. Before we do, if you haven't subscribed already, please consider subscribing and liking the video. Alright, so start with an introduction. Uh, so he... Okay, let's just jump over here. He says... In this article, I will be proposing that there is a fatal flaw in the presuppositionalist position, specifically the position held by Cornelius Van Til. Alright, so that's good. It means it's relevant to me and to most viewers of this channel because if you all didn't already know I am a Van Tilian, a Van Tilian presuppositionalist. So I am interested in only the Vantilian version of presuppositionalism because there are a lot of versions. So this is a relevant article. He says, I will begin by giving a brief overview of defining elements of Vantil's version of presuppositionalism. This will be followed by an argument in which I seek to demonstrate that there is a seemingly insurmountable obstacle that plagues Vantil's presuppositionalism. I will conclude by noting some consequences that follow if my argument is successful. Alright, so that's the basic gist of what he's trying to do with the article. So let's see if he actually succeeds at that. So he gives an overview of Van Tilian presuppositionalism, the, what he thinks are the core claims. He mentioned that in order to know anything truly, in order to be able to arrive at the conclusion that God exists through a reasoning process, in order to ask a question about God, in order to create art, in order for logic to touch reality, in order for man to be able to intelligently use words, etc., and in order to even be able to think truly about innate and acquired knowledge, we must first presuppose that God exists as the ultimate ground of all things. Uh, on the surface, I see no problem with that. Uh, yeah, so we could just move on. I think that is a claim that Van Silians want to make. So he says, unless we presuppose that God... Oh. Yeah, that is one thing in this article. He has very long footnotes. Uh, yeah, that in and of itself isn't a flaw, but it, it kind of uh, makes it hard to read. Anyways, that's just a little side note. And also, 
he doesn't give any direct quotes from Van Til. That's another thing you should note. He lists a lot of page numbers from Van Til's books, but he never gives any direct quotes. So I think that um, is also something we should keep in mind. So he says, unless we presuppose that God, that is the God of the Bible, exists, we will be unable to know anything truly, even the facts of science that may be discovered by a non-Christian scientist. Yeah, that's all right. So far, so good. He then goes on to say, this primary, this primary claim is founded upon the following principles. The presuppositionalist system of Van Til is based on the idea that there is no rational being that ever ceases to interpret the world which presents itself to it. Hmm. Yeah, I think in, in one sense, that is that is the case. Yeah, that is true. That's something that advanced here in the whole, that everyone interprets the world in some way. Right. It says this interpretation is based on a complex interpretative structure that determines how they understand the many phenomena that come into contact with them, including the meaning or significance they give to this phenomena. Yeah, right, so it's a kind of interpretative priority that is given to any form of thought. Right, so far, so good. Another long footnote, a whole page of footnotes, wow. Although there are some important things in the footnotes, but we'll, we'll get to those eventually. Another foundational principle of Van Til's presuppositionist system is the claim that there is no neutral, common, or unbiased position or ground from which human beings may interpret the phenomena we find in this world and dispute among themselves in order to discover the truth. And this, I think, is the fundamental position or claim which leads to his error. And that error is propagated throughout the rest of the article. What is the claim of no neutrality? Because definitely Van Til makes the claim that there is no neutrality. That is one of the fundamental tenets of Van Til's apologetic but it is it is a, a principle it is a thesis that is made in the context of apologetic discussions so what Van Til is trying to say is that there is no neutrality when it comes to the claims of Christian theism so if one wants to engage an unbeliever there is no common ground epistemologically between the Christian and the unbeliever because they have different worldviews by which they interpret the world. So when he says that there is no neutral position from which human beings may interpret the phenomenon we find in this world, it's, he seems he is taking the no neutrality principle that is meant to apply within the realm of apologetics and extending it to apply to everything, to every phenomenon we find in this world. It, it just seems like a subtle bait and switch, but it has fundamental implications. He is overextending the scope over and above what Van Til actually meant. Uh, to claim that there is no neutral ground from which we can interpret the phenomenon we find in this world. It is also difficult to know what exactly he means by this. If it's just a consequence of his earlier statement that all humans interpret their experience, if we take it in that way, then perhaps it's correct, but then nothing of interest follows from that. But we can see what he means because he clarifies in the next sentence, he says, there is not, therefore, some common or neutral ground between the different interpretative schemas from which we could judge these interpretative schemas. And see, that's the problem. Van Til's 
neutrality principle applies in the realm of apologetic discussions. It doesn't apply to interpretative schemas or what some have called conceptual schemes as a whole. It follows, therefore, that human beings must always and necessarily interpret everything from within some interpretative schema. Though that much is true, uh, I think everyone has a worldview, and that worldview informs how they interpret the world. Let's see what kind of conclusion he's going to draw from this. Well, he goes on, he, he tries to lay out the problem with presuppositionalism now. So first of all, he uh, notes some important contribution that presuppositional apologetics has made. But let's just skip to the actual problem he poses for Van Til. He says, the biggest problem for presuppositionism is not found in its commitment to Calvinist theology, but rather in the philosophical presuppositions that are, according to Van Til, fundamental to the reform system. Okay, he says, the Achilles heel of Van Til is his commitment to the idea that all rational beings observe necessarily the phenomena of this world through an interpretative schema by which they interpret everything and from which they cannot escape and that there is therefore no common ground these two claims together cause significant problems for presuppositionism you see here's the problem it is true that van Silians would assert that all rational beings observe the world through an interpretative schema or through a conceptual scheme or through a worldview. But the Van Cilian doesn't have to accept this no common ground principle that he's trying to propose because the no neutrality or the no common ground principle that Van Til proposed, like I said, is a kind of narrow principle that applies in apologetics dis discussions, it doesn't. It's not something that is a. It's not a metaphysical principle. It's a. It's a. An apologetic one. Like there is no neutrality when it comes to addressing the claims of the Bible or of Christian theism. One cannot be neutral with respect to Christian theism. That is all that the Van Cilian has to admit. He doesn't have to admit that there is some metaphysical divide between all rational agents with different interpretative schemas. So I think that the fundamental error that is made in this article, and that error propagates throughout his thesis. Let's, let us continue. Yeah, he said that if this were true, then it would seem that there is no way to know with any measure of certainty that Van Til is telling the truth and that all other views say false. So he says there are no reasons that can be given to either defend his system or to attack his system. The difficulty that we are raising against presuppositionalism could be presented as follows. Okay, so he tries to present like a formalization of what he's trying to argue. So, premise one is the interpretative schema of each person includes all the claims that are accepted as true by that person and which are used to understand and interpret the world in which this person finds themselves. All right. We could accept that. Uh, we could accept that as a definition of interpretative schema or what Fantilians might call worldview. Uh, it says, in order to know that his interpretive schema is true, a person must be able to have unmediated and uninterpreted access in some way or another to reality in order to compare the statements of his schema with the way things really are. And I think this is the premise that the Van Tilian could reject. I don't think it's true. And that invalidate the entire argument.
I think the argument is unsound because I think this premise is false. But let's go on. Let's just run through the argument and see what he says in defense of it before we could, before I give my criticisms. Uh, premise three is that if a person interprets all of reality through his interpretative schema, then he cannot have unmediated and uninterpreted access to reality in order to compare the proposed truth claims of the schema with the way in which things really are. In other words, there is no common ground. You see, the this common ground or no neutrality principle that he attributes to Van Til is plays a major part in his argument. But as I've already pointed out, that principle is too broad in scope compared to what Van Til was actually proposing. The fourth premise says, all rational beings interpret always and with season the world around them through an interpretative schema. Right, so we would accept that. He says that premises two to four forces to either accept an absolute relativism of interpretative schemas or to, t or to make self-contradictory claims. Yeah, so it seems to me that the the remainder of the premises try to lay out this the consequences of this dilemma that he has posed. So I think premises two to four are the crux of his argument. But like I've said, I don't think premise two is true. But let's see what he has to say in defense of it first. Yeah, it seems then that if the fundamental claim of presuppositionalism the only premise that really distinguished the approach from pre of presuppositionalism from the approach of classical Christian theology apologetics. That's not true. That is not the only claim that distinguishes the method of presuppositionalism from classical apologetics. Yeah, once again, he brings up this um, overextended no common ground principle which the Vatilian can reject. Let's go on. So he asks, is there any way to avoid this embarrassing situation? In order to avoid the pains of self-contradiction, we must reject one of three following premises, two, three, or four. Yeah, we have already rejected two. So he says, we are left with only one premise that we can reject if we want to save Van Til from the pains of self-contradiction. The second premise. It says, but the second premise is nothing other than the application of the cor correspondence theory of truth to the question of interpretative schemes. If we reject the second premise, then it follows that we could never know that our particular interpretative schema is true and we are obliged to accept an absolute relativism of interpretative schemas from which we cannot escape. Okay, let's go back real quick and try, let me remember what premise two actually says. Premise two says that um, in order to know that his interpretative schema is true, a person must be able to have unmediated access to reality in order to compare the statements of the schema with the way things really are. All right. And I said that doesn't have to be the case. So what he's saying is that um, if we reject premise two, then it follows that we we could never know that our particular interpretative schema is true. Well, no, that's not the case. And I think this is the crux of the disagreement that I don't think we need to possess unmediated access to reality apart from an interpretative schema in order to know whether or not our interpretative schema is true. I think that revelational epistemology is able to secure knowledge of reality and of the true interpretative schema on its own, right, without a kind of so-called unmediated access to reality, right? The doctrine of 
revelation and creation tells us that human beings are created in the image of God. And that image of God reveals God to the human psyche. So the human consciousness is designed to provide constant revelation of the creator. We have knowledge of God as creator, of ourselves as creatures, and of the world as being created by God. We do not need unmed unmediated access to reality. What we need is just access to our own self-consciousness, which ties us to God. So because man's conscience reveals God, knowledge of ourselves gives us knowledge of God, and knowledge of God gives us knowledge of his world. So we know that our interpretive schemas actually reflect reality because we know that they reflect the mind of God because we are made in his image. So all we need is access to God. Epistemic access to God grants us epistemic access to reality. So our knowledge of the true interpretive schemas is provided by revelation. We do not have to, on our own, breeze the gap between our minds and reality. So that, that's like the basic thesis of Van Til's epistemology. So it's quite puzzling why he would leave that out. Because this is something that Van Til discusses in his works. Uh, so I, I think that just destroys the second premise of the argument. So the argument is unsound because we can know that our interpretative schemes are true without possessing unmediated access. So we, we, we do not affirm autonomy in epistemology. We know that on our own, we wouldn't be able to tell whether our interpretative schemes are true. But because we have revelation, we are able to know such things. It's just the fundamentals of revelation and epistemology here. We, we can, the Vantillian can safely reject the second premise without any consequence. So we can reject the second premise on the basis that it is false. We do not need unmediated access to reality in order to know that our interpretive schemes are true. Yeah, so I, th I think that deals with the major argument he's making in this paper. But I also think that one misconception that the author has is that there are various interpretative schemes. But that's not the case. There's only one or I think it's more accurate to say that there are two interpretive schemes in actuality. We have the divine interpretative scheme and we have the human interpretative scheme, which is a reflection, a kind of analogical reflection of the exhaustive and comprehensive an archetypal scheme that God possesses. And so all human beings have the same interpretative scheme in a sense. So let me clarify that. What we want to say is that there are various interpretative schemes because everyone has different beliefs, right? But these schemes are variations on a more fundamental interpretative scheme, which is the Christian scheme, right? Because everyone is made in God's image. And so everyone possesses knowledge of the creator. And all our conceptual schemes are designed in the same way. But experience and things like that conditions us to possess various other beliefs which flesh out this generic conceptual scheme 
that we have. But this generic conceptual scheme is what enables us to have knowledge of the world. It is this unity of conceptual schemes that allows things like communication to be possible and language because we possess the same conceptual scheme at the most fundamental level we are able to understand each other because our concepts track one another and track reality and so i think that is a a, a mistake that he makes here because he mentioned that there are things like the islamic interpretive scheme or the atheist and things like that well in theory there are such such things but in practice there's only one interpretive scheme which is the christian scheme which is the conceptual scheme that god created all human beings with and so i think that does it for this article uh it's a, it's a fundamental mistake that is made even at the scholarly level so i think it's it is important that vancillians are aware of these arguments and how to respond to them thanks for watching this video please like and subscribe and i'll see you all next time